Chapter 19 of The Flying Saucers Are Real. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Flying Saucers Are Real by Donald Kehoe. Chapter 19. For two weeks after my return to Washington, General Sory Smith held off a final answer about my trip to Wright Field. Meantime, Ken Purdy had called him, backing my request to see the project files. It was obvious to me that Wright Field was determined not to open the files, but the general was trying to avoid making it official. "'Why can't you accept my word there's nothing to the saucers?' he asked me one day. "'You're impeaching my personal veracity.' But finally he saw there was no other way out. He told me I had been officially refused permission to see the Wright Field files. Some time later, Ken Purdy phoned General Smith. General, if the Air Force wants to talk to us off the record, we'll play ball. True, we'll either handle it from then on, whatever way you think best, or we'll keep still. Whether this offer was relayed higher up, I don't know, but nothing came of it. Meantime, saucer reports had begun to come in from all over the country. Some even came from abroad. Some of these 1950 sightings have already been mentioned in early chapters. Besides the strange affair at Tucson on February 1st, there were several other cases in February. Three of these were in South America. One saucer was reported near the Naval Air Station at Alameda, California. Some were sighted in Texas, New Mexico, and other parts of the Southwest. In March, the wave of sightings reached such a height that the Air Force again denied the saucer's existence. This followed a report that a flying disc had crashed near Mexico City and that the wreckage had been viewed by U.S. Air Force officials. Scores of Orangeburg, South Carolina residents watched a disk that hovered over that city on March 10th. It was described as silver bright, turning slowly in the air before it disappeared. The day before this, residents of Van Nuys, California, saw a bright disk moving swiftly 400 feet in the air. Seen through a telescope, it appeared to be 50 feet in diameter. Discs were reported at numerous places in Mexico, including Guadalajara, Juarez, Mazatlan, and Durango. On the 12th of March, the crew and passengers of an American airline ship saw a large gleaming disc high above Monterey Airport in Mexico. Captain W. R. Hunt, the senior airline pilot, watched the disk through a theodolite at the airport. This disk and most of the others seen in Mexico were similar in description to the one sighted at Dayton, Ohio, on March 8th. This was the large metallic saucer that hovered high over Vandalia Airport until Air Force and National Guard fighters raced up after it. The disk rose vertically into the sky at incredible speed hovered a while longer, and then vanished. Within twenty-four hours, this mystery disk had been identified as the planet Venus. It was broad daylight. Newspapers quoted trained astronomical officials in Dayton as the source for this explanation. Meanwhile, the Mexican government newspaper, El Nacional, quoted a famous and reputable astronomer as saying the numerous disks reported over Mexico carry visitors from Mars. One of the strangest reports came from the Naval Air Station at Dallas, Texas. It was about 11.30 a.m. on March 16th when CPO Charles Lewis saw a disk streak up at a B-36 bomber. The disk appeared about 20 to 25 feet in diameter, Lewis reported. Racing at incredible speed, it shot up under the bomber, hung there for a second, then broke away at a 45-degree angle. Following this, it shot straight up into the air and disappeared. 
Captain M. A. Nation, C.O. of the station, said it was the second report in ten days. On March 7th, said Captain Nation, a tower control operator named C. E. Edmondson saw a similar disk flying so fast it was almost a blur. He estimated its speed at 3,000 to 4,000 miles per hour, Captain Nation stated. Of course, he had no instruments to compute the speed, so that's a pure estimate. It was some time before this when I heard the first crazy rumor about the guided missile display. This story, which had new details every time I heard it, described the Air Force as refusing to let the Navy announce a new type of missile. According to the rumors, the Air Force was trying to prove its own missile far superior to keep the Navy from invading its long-range bombing domain. Then the Army joined the pitched battle with still a third guided missile, according to the rumors. And the flying disks? Army, Navy, and Air Force missiles launched in droves all over the country to prove whose was the best? A public missile race with a Joint Chiefs of Staff to decide the winner. It seems fantastic that this theory would be believed by any intelligent person. In effect, it accuses the armed services of deliberate criminal negligence, of endangering millions in the cities below. I am convinced that some of these rumors led to at least one of the published guesses about our missile program. One widely publicized story stated that the flying saucers seen hurtling through our skies are actually two types of secret weapons. One, according to radio and newspaper accounts, is a disk that whizzes through space, halts suspended in the air, soars to 30,000 feet, drops to 1,000 feet, and then usually disintegrates in the air. These saucers, it was said, ranged from 20 inches to 250 feet in diameter. They were supposed to be pilotless and harmless. The second type was said to be a jet version of the Navy's circular airfoil flying flapjack. It was credited with fantastic speed. The true disks, however, were mainly Air Force devices, according to the report. Some are guided, others are not, said the radio commentator who released this story. They can stay stationary, dash off to right or left, and move like lightning, but they are utterly harmless. In these harmless disks, there was supposed to be an explosive charge that destroyed them in mid-air at a predetermined time. Within a few days after this story was broadcast, the United States News and World Report declared that the saucers are real and identified them as jet models of Navy flying flapjacks. This magazine, which is not an official publication despite its name, mentioned the variable direction jet principle that I had previously described in the true article. These two flying saucer explanations brought denials from the White House, the Navy, and the Air Force. The Air Force flatly declared that, one, none of the armed forces is conducting secret experiments with disc-shaped flying objects that could be a basis for the reported phenomena, Two, there is no evidence that the latter stem from the activities of any foreign nation. Before this, President Truman stated he knew nothing of any such objects being developed by the United States or any other nation. The Navy denial came immediately after the first broadcast story. It ran, the Navy is not engaged in research or in flying any jet-powered, circular-shaped aircraft. The Navy added that one model of a pancake-shaped aircraft, called the Zimmerman Skimmer, was built but was never flown. However, a small 3,000-pound scale model did fly and was under radio control during flight. 
This last device is now being rumored as the Navy's unpiloted missile, said to have been launched over the country like the so-called harmless disks. Even though all these accounts have been officially denied, many Americans may still believe they are true. I have no desire to criticize the authors of these stories. I believe that in following up certain guided missile leads, they were misled into accepting the conclusions they gave. But these stories, particularly the accounts of huge unpiloted disks, may have planted certain fears in the public mind, fears that are completely unwarranted. For this reason, I have personally checked at Washington in regard to the dangers of unpiloted missiles. Here are the facts I learned. 1. Neither the Army, Navy, nor Air Force has at any time staged any guided missile competition as rumored. 2. No unpiloted missiles or remote-controlled experimental craft have been tested over American cities or heavily populated areas. 3. No unpiloted missile carrying dangerous explosives, whether for destruction of the device or other purposes, has been deliberately launched or tested over heavily populated areas. In regard to the so-called jet-propelled flying flapjack, I have been assured by Admiral Calvin Bolster of the Navy Bureau of Aeronautics that this type of plane has never been produced. I concede that he might make this statement to conceal a secret development, but there is one fact of which every American can be certain. Neither this type nor the radio-controlled smaller model has been or will be flown or launched over areas where people would be endangered. The three armed services are working on guided missiles. They are not risking American lives by launching such missiles at random across the United States. Although most of our guided missile projects are secret, it is possible to give certain facts about guided missile developments in general. The first successful long-range missiles were produced by the Germans. These were the Buzz Bomb and the V-2 rocket. But research in various other types was carried on during the war. Some of this was with oval and round types of airfoils. As already stated by Paul Riddell, there is strong evidence that the disc-shaped foil resulted from German observations of either spaceships or remote-control disc-shaped observer units. All the Nazi space exploration plans followed this discovery that we were being observed by a race from another planet. After the end of World War II, the international guided missile race began, with the British, Russians, and ourselves as the chief contenders. Numerous types have been developed, winged bombs, small radar-guided projectiles launched from planes, and ground-to-plane, plane-to-ground, and plane-to-plane -plane missiles, equipped with target homing devices. In certain recent types, the range can be stated as several hundred miles. So far as I have learned, after weeks of rechecking this point, not a single long-range missile has been identified as Russian. Since this country is working closely with Great Britain on global defense problems, it is no violation of security to say that we have probably exchanged certain guided missile information. In regard to the British long-range missile picture outlined to me by John Steele, I can state two major facts. 1. The British have categorically denied testing such long-range missiles over American territory where they might endanger American citizens. There is convincing evidence that they are telling the truth. 2. There is no British missile now built or planned that could explain the object seen by Captain Mantell, Chiles and Whitted, and witnesses in most of the major sightings. 
The preceding statement applies equally to American-built missiles. There is no experimental craft or guided missile even remotely considered in this country that would begin to approach the dimensions and performance of the spaceship seen in these cases. There is concrete evidence that the United States is as well advanced as any other nation in guided missile development. Certain recent advances should place us in the lead, unless confidential reports on Soviet progress are completely wrong. If American scientists and engineers can learn the source of the spaceship's power and adapt it to our use, it may well be the means for ending the threat of war. The Soviet scientists are well aware of this. Their research into cosmic rays and other natural forces has been redoubled since the flying saucer reports of 1947. The secret of the spaceship's power is more important than even the hydrogen bomb. It may someday be the key to the fate of the world. End of chapter 19